Let's start. So when Klaus opened the first NOAA conference in 2009, he gave his chronic speech or this interesting speech about that European companies are underfunded versus the European ones. And he said, our ecosystem is fucked up and it got a lot of press attention. How is it today, Manu? Uh, does, do European companies have enough capital to compete globally? I, I definitely think that there's opportunity for the best stars in Europe to get money. And take two of our portfolio companies, Spotify, which has originated out of Europe and has continued to garner a lot of money and build a global business. And more recently, Go Euro, which we found quite early and has taken a, a very substantial amount of money, close to $150 million. But here's the interesting part about it, Marco. The question is, where did that money come from? One of the motivations we have at Lakestar is we don't want the best entrepreneurs to go for the Series A or the Series B checks immediately outside of Europe. We want to keep them here in Europe, build them a little bit further and further, but ultimately, if we do need to take very, very large pools of capital, you know, these checks do reside in Asia or in the United States. And I think that's why we take an approach of being very global from day one, global in our thinking from the company's perspective, global in our capital raisings from the company's perspective and how we advise them. So I think there is opportunity, excuse me, but I would say that it depends where that capital comes from. So capital finds good companies no matter where they are. Fabrice is one of these European entrepreneurs who left Europe. Um, wh wh why are you working mostly out of the US? Uh, what did you find there, what you didn't find in Europe? Well, two things. The first thing you find in the U.S. is just a larger market. You have a whole bunch of rich early adopters who are willing to try new things. And so, and it's so much easier to operate in one market. In fact, when we invest in U.S. companies, one of our recommendations usually is do not go global. Because when you're at 100 million revenues in the U.S., it's easier to go from 100 to 200 in the U.S. than to zero to 100 anywhere else. If you're raising capital there, it's easier. And so, it's more important that you execute. I mean, and that's not true of all businesses. Some businesses have uh, global network effects or easy to launch globally because they're maybe user-generated content. But if you have like inventory, logistics, supply chains, and we just tell American companies, stay in the US, you'll ultimately be able to buy the other companies at higher, and you're gonna be worth more than them anyway, and capital is more available. Um, on the capital point, so we look at it across the, the stages. Seed capital, frankly, is available globally. It's available in Europe. Um, it's available, it's available, frankly, in emerging markets, even in small markets. And late stage capital, to, to Gupta's point, is also available because the American capital will find you if your company is worth more than $100 million. So the, the late stage capital will find you. The issue that I found in Europe is the Series A money and the Series B money is way harder to come about. It's gotten better over the years with uh, Lakestar, with Excel, with um, Felix Capital, with DN Capital, investing especially in the UK and, and in Germany, but in the rest of Europe, and, there, and there's some, and, and as well in, like in uh, Spain, Sweden. For example. In the rest of Europe, it's actually harder. Or it's yeah. really hard to get the Series A, Series B. So there's kind of this Series A, B crunch in Europe where you have a good startup at the seed, but then it's, it has a really hard time raising And the isn't energy. that weird? And because my, my understanding is that the economics to invest into startups in Europe is still a lot more lucrative for investors. It seems to me that in Europe, companies are more reasonably valued. You don't have to have billions of losses to get billions of valuations. Is there, Manu, you still think or there should be a valuation discrepancy between the countries? I, I think there is, and I think it's justified because unfortunately, while we've seen Springer and ProSieben be very active in acquiring companies, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I haven't seen as many exits in Europe. And I read a statistic in CB Insights that said of the last 8,000 acquisitions in Europe, 82 of the material acquisitions happened from U.S. buyers. Now, I don't know if that statistic is exactly right, but look, if, even if it's directionally right, if we don't have a reemergence of liquidity for our early stage entrepreneurs to reinvest into the ecosystem because they haven't exited their businesses, then we can't continue to foster this ecosystem. And so there will always be that valuation discrepancy. The, the only other thing I'd add, Marco, to your earlier point is, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, money has a flight plan. And today, the flight plan is in Europe is Stockholm, London, and Berlin. 
And there are some great entrepreneurs in, in Spain and some in Lisbon, but, but you know, anecdotally, if an entrepreneur was coming from Eastern Europe and he needed to go or she needed to go to London to talk to all the money, they come to NOAA conference. Yeah, they, exactly. But, but what would happen is they, the VCs would want to meet the entrepreneur three, four, or five times. So if you're an early stage entrepreneur coming and flying over from Eastern Europe, coming to London, doing meetings four or five times with each of the VCs, you're not focusing on your core business. And what that led me to believe is that unfortunately in Europe, you need to be very close to the money today or you need mm. to be very close to the money's flight plan today until the rest of the ecosystems develop, the rest of the cities outside of Berlin, Stockholm and London. So if you had Berlin and London or Stockholm, I would also add Tel Aviv for that matter, of by course, the way. Tel Aviv. Uh, you have better chances to get funded. Fabrice, is that true? You see this similar? A absolutely. I mean, it's also to a lifestyle issue. If you're a venture capitalist, you really want to be on the board of a company that's going to be uh, in Eastern Europe. And, and the, for most of them, the answer is no. I mean, there's a famous saying, uh, I can't remember which venture capitalist in Silicon Valley said, you didn't want to invest in a company that was more than 30 minutes from his office. I heard that. And it, it's really true. I mean, we're seeing it in the US as well. If you're in New York and Boston and Chicago and LA and, and San Francisco, you're getting funded. But if you're in Miami, it's actually really hard, even if your company is amazing. And so in Europe, uh, it is really Stockholm, uh, Berlin, and London, and in the US, it's the cities I just mentioned. Interesting, so we are not that digital after all. You do want to hang out, wine and dine, your future investor. Manu, uh, Klaus had a huge, or has a huge interest to advocate the idea that the old economy, we elegantly called them for our Berlin edition, the champions, yep. um, get involved with the challengers. That is the concept of our Berlin conference, which is bigger than our London conference, a number of attendees. And we saw huge interest from companies out of the financial services industry, automotive, yet, and, and you see next Berlin, nor a, a, a huge run from the automotive companies. Have you both seen that in America, this Dollar Shave Club being picked up, What's going on with traditional businesses and their appetite to grow the digital side of business? They're struggling to get talent in. A lot of them have now their own VC funds like Deutsche Bahn, etc. But And I know Lakestar, you spend a lot of time yep. cultivating and educating the world about internet. So what's, what's the update on that? Uh, at least from our perspective, yes, we do spend a lot of time with large corporates in and around Europe and a little bit in the US, but mostly in Europe, really talking to them about how to build digital strategies. And we do it for two reasons. One is I think, you know, we're here, we need to make this the best ecosystem we possibly can. And, and if we don't, then these large corporates are in dire, dire uh, positions to get disrupted very quickly. Now, the one difference that we've seen is that what we read in the news about, say, Jet getting acquired for a very large valuation, Dollar Shave Club, Honest Company, etc. We're not seeing strategics in Europe willing to pay for cash burning businesses for that strategic value. It's more rare, let's say it that way. It's more rare. And so I think it's an education process. And But I we also lack these companies. I mean, if you look at Europe and the direct to consumer businesses, where you have in the US Warby Parker, The Honest Company, you have Harry's, Dollar Shave Club, etc. We have, do we have market. those in Europe? They don't exist, and why don't they exist? Well, they do exist, actually, in Europe. The, you have the equivalent of every one of these in every single, in every single country. Just 20 vertical, times smaller. But much smaller, because each of, every one of the individual markets are smaller. Look, and is it they're smaller because the market isn't ready, or because they have less capital to acquire customers? It's a combination. You, A, well, no, the markets are ready. The, there is demand for the underlying products. I mean, the reality is consumers are the same globally, and if an idea works somewhere, it's a tendency to work everywhere. The issue is, A, the, any, any of the individual markets are smaller, but B, there's less capital, and so you have less capital to build a brand. You have less capital to acquire customers. Um, and ultimately, there are also fewer exits because there are fewer buyers and, f and, and fewer buyers willing to pay up. And so 
it actually makes sense for the valuation delta because if your exit of a multiple is going to be lower, well, then your, your investing multiple is going to be lower. In terms of working with corporates, to be honest, it's great to have them as buyers, but doing partnerships with them is extraordinarily painful. And if you're a young startup, it may kill you because they're so slow moving, they're going to require so many things, they're going to be distracting. Often you're just better off trying to disrupt them and eventually have them try to buy you rather than trying to work with them. It and is does really it make hard. sense to have them as an investor rather than just as a partner? In is it a good way to build yourself a potential buyer for the exit if you have like a minority share given to your biggest offline competitor? As usual, I can, make, I, can, I, can, I can say both sides of the coin. On the one hand, having them on your cap table with minority rights, no right of first refusal, definitely, um, can actually be interesting because then they get to know you better and, and, they, and they can potentially decide to buy you. And maybe in Europe where they're shot more gun shy, it might make sense. On average, I would say it's a bad idea. And on average, I would say it's a bad idea for two reasons. One is once you see how the sausage is made, it's never super pretty. Uh, there, there are ups and downs, and there are good days and bad days, but may, you, you lose a little bit of that mystique and aura when you see that their, their companies are not always as perfect as they may seem from the outside. Um, and two, frankly, even though that company may not have a right of first refusal, many other potential buyers may assume that essentially there's an implicit one and that that person is going to have more information. And so if they're not bidding or they're not a high bidder, you may not, want, you may not even want to bid. And so you may actually be decreasing the number of potential buyers for your company by having a potential acquirer strategic on your cap table. So I would actually recommend to stick to financial investors and VCs and only bring them in later stage if you need them or if you, there's a, something really, a, a really valuable or a good reason for it, uh, or just sell to them, but don't actually have them as investors. So, so Manu, what makes a good financial investor? Um, is it just the kind of personal touch, the kind of, man, do I get along with this person? Do I want to sit next to him on the long airplane ride? Or what value add should entrepreneurs expect from investors? What should they ask for and shouldn't be shy about asking? I think uh, that's a great question. I think, I think on one hand, we always want to be founder friendly. On the other hand, there are times when you need the investors who have been through the challenges themselves. Either they've invested in enough companies that they've seen the challenges mm -hmm. to make the hard decisions. And the hard decisions are changing management helping think a little bit through product market fit. And even if we're not sitting in the shoes, we can never sit in your shoes as entrepreneurs and say, we understand every single one of the plights that you go through. But you know what? We have a big enough network that we can help find you advisors and mentors to really help build a step change in your operation and help you get through both the, the good times and the bad times. And I think that's really what the value add is. And, and really- Where have you last yelled as one of your CEOs? Sorry? When have you last yelled or screamed at one of your... Unfortunately... You're not a yeller, I think, but... Well, yeah, you, unfortunately, uh, it's probably nothing I would advertise as well. But, you know, it does happen. I mean, we've had to change CEOs in our operations. It's a really sad, it's a really sad thing to go through. Um, it's not easy, but what but I would... save the companies? But what I would tell you is that if you... If for every moment you delay that discussion, it's a worse off for both the entrepreneur, all the employees, and most importantly for the investors and RLPs. Now, in, in the US, if you look at Uber and Airbnb, it looks like the United Nations of the investor A-star teams. Um, Fabrice, the investor in the US who's coming in, it strikes me, is working a lot less hard than the European equivalent. Is it simply a function of the number of uh, investors behind US companies? I mean, we have here the CEO of Domo coming later. I looked up all the investors there. I was like, oh my God, it's like 18 or so. Um, what is different between the US and the European market in terms of what the investor is doing? The, so the, you get that impression, frankly, from the later stage companies like Uber and Airbnb because they've raised billions of dollars. So at some point you start reaching like the marginal pool of capital. Um, but in the earlier stages, it's reasonably similar. So if you're at a series, if you're looking to raise your series A and you're gonna pick a venture capitalist who's going to be on your board, 
um, it's actually frankly like getting married. And so it's actually not the, the, the brand name. It's not like, oh, Sequoia or Andreessen. It's like actually which partner is going to be on your board? Or are they going to be on your side? And, and are they going to be th supportive in the hard times? And the hard times are going to come. And so the brand of the company doesn't really matter. It's the person you're with. And when they think of the value add, different funds have actually specialized with different things. So Andreessen will tell you, oh, we're going to help you recruit. We're going to have all these And the Andreessen Horowitz guys have Horowitz a ratio guys. of like support staff yeah. helping the company with marketing, exactly. PR, hiring, technical questions of like five to one to investment. Yeah. So great, is, yeah. that, is that something which, which Atomico, I think, has a similar approach? Is that something? So for some people, it's useful. For some people, it's not useful. If you're Greylock, they also help you recruit or do PR. If you have a big fund, you can afford it from an economics perspective. If you're a smaller fund, no. Um, I guess my advice to the entrepreneurs when they're looking for people that join their board and VCs is really three things. One is someone you're going to be able to get along with. Two is someone who's going to do no evil, who's not going to create work for you. Like the last thing you want is them to be value destroying as an investor. Um, you know, and number three, someone who can help you. But the reality is VCs, for the most part, can't necessarily help you. Um, in, in our case, we've actually created a, a specific, we have two expertise or three expertise we try to help our entrepreneurs with. A, we help them fundraise because we know VCs. Uh, B, we have uh, marketing experience because we've spent over a billion dollars in TV advertising, and so we're better than most at like getting lower customer acquisition costs, and so we provide that service for free. Um, and then three, we get out of your way. We don't want reporting, we don't want anything else. And so we try to tell our entrepreneurs, get VCs who, who are gonna get out of your way, who are gonna support you, and bring whatever it is you need. And, and maybe you do want Greylock and Andreessen, and you do want them to help you recruit, yeah. and you do want them to help you in PR, et cetera. Maybe you don't need it. So it really, it really depends. Okay, one, thank you. One last question. Um, we saw in the US a lot of Fundings happening before the IPO, and it looks like the fund stuff is starting before the company goes public. In in Europe, we have also seen some initiatives. There's like Key Partners Capital, which is helping family offices to invest in internet. I guess after you guys come in and created a model with the entrepreneurs, which works, which is scalable, and then it's just a question of raising more capital. Manu. What's your view on these new investors? There, there, there's like Bill for Gailey and a lot of new yep. um, yeah, types of investors chasing digital ideas. I guess they come in a little bit later. And yep. do, do you welcome those on board? You know, and, and, and it's really interesting. I think we're seeing that also from China a lot. Yeah. Also coming into Europe. So we're spending a lot more time, and myself included, spending time thinking about Chinese capital and what assistance they can provide to our European or US portfolio. And, and what I would say by this is, you know, you mentioned family offices, you mentioned uh, the, the later stage guys pre-IPO. <clears throat> there is a role to play. And maybe that role is a little bit, as you mentioned, Fabrice, hey, look, they don't want to be involved or they don't want board seats and maybe it's more about capital. Is that dumb capital? It's capital. <laughs> I, I, I don't necessarily think so because at that stage, it's capital where even one or two phone calls could be assistance, right? So for example, you know, we're looking at taking in a very large pool of capital from a no-name Chinese fund, but it's, it's 100 million in value, and even if they could help us with three critical introductions in China, those three might just kickstart it for us. I and after see. that, we don't need their involvement, but that relationship, long as the expectations are understood from day one, I think that's completely fine for us. And, and, you know, look, in Europe, as we discussed earlier today on stage, sometimes we just need to pool our capital together because, yes, there are some funds like us and Atomico and Excel, et cetera, that can deploy large pools of capital here. But sometimes we also do need to rely a lot more on the corporates and the family offices to build bigger pools of capital. I mean, if you look at the largest successful billion-plus valuation companies, they've taken in an average of $250 million. So you guys, as, as good as you are fine-tuning the business model of people, you're also supporting them to think about the next capital round. Yeah. Is that something you guys do as FJ Labs as well? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we built a, a, an AI and a forum where people, or entrepreneurs actually come in. They, they always tell us, okay, how much burn we have, how much capital we have. Um, 
what category they're in, and then we actually cross that with all the VCs that would be at the right stage for them were based on like their current traction and burn, and who, who are not conflicted, and then we make intros. And by virtue of the fact that, A, we're not competing with the VCs, we're really their partners, and we know these VCs well, they get the intro. So it's extremely valuable for the entrepreneur because we help them fundraise. If you're a startup, you're always fundraising, and for us, it's not that much time, so absolutely. Excellent. Well, I see Chris is coming already from Verivox. So uh, thank you so much, guys. It was truly inspiring. And it looks like uh, Europe is not lost against the US, thanks to your help. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.